global death yes. cardiovascular diseases in the year 2021. You can see the atrial fibrillation of filter, that is a type of arrhythmia. However, the arrhythmias can be uh, a risk factor or associated to other cardiovascular diseases like the hypertensive heart disease, ischemic stroke, and ischemic heart disease. Because of this, it's very important and the detection of dangerous arrhythmia. <laughs> to detect the arrhythmia, we use an electrocardiogram. The arrhythmia is a uh, an abnormality in the electrical system of the heart. And uh, that, that produces uh, irregular heart rings. And here in this slide, you can see two images. That corresponds to an electrocardiogram. These images were taken from the MIT BIH arrhythmia database. And in the left, you can see an example of normal beats, and in the right, you can see an example of a type of arrhythmia. In this case, the combination between ventricular and supraventricular. So what is our objective? Our objective is to facilitate identification and classification of arrhythmias to help medical staff to refer patients to specialists. In order to, to make an early detection and reduce the mortality rate. This we decided to use a one day convolutional neural network. This type of CNN process one dimensional data, like time series, that corresponds to an electrocardiogram. As you can see, first we have the input. And then the convolution layers extracted features. Then the pooling layers reduce the dimension of these features. And finally, the fully connected layers make the classification. And then we have the output. That corresponds to a general convolutional neural network. So the data set that we decided to use was taken from cable, which contains signals from the MIT BIH arrhythmia database. Their principal characteristics are that we have five classes uh, divided in normal and abnormal. The abnormal class uh, are four. Three, were, I mean, three are a type of arrhythmia. And the fourth is the no pathology. This corresponds to segments that don't, don't can be classified uh, like the other classes. In this case, uh, our classes are the normal, the supraventricular arrhythmia, the ventricular arrhythmia, the combination between supraventricular and ventricular, and no pathology. Each one of the classes are denoted by a letter, the N, S, P, L, and Q respectively. In addition, uh, this data set was of sample and 125 hertz and segmented per herpit. Each segment was normalized to 188 samples and padded with zeros. And because of the frequency, each segment corresponds to 1.5 seconds. In this slide, you can see uh, five examples. Each one corresponds to one of the classes. First, we have a normal beat, the supraventricular arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia, the combination between supraventricular and ventricular, and no pathology. As you can see, the amplitude go from zero to one, and in the end of each segment, we have a lot of zeros. This is because of the padding. The data set was unbalanced. So we decided uh, balance using the technique mode. As you can see, after balance, the normal class has 23% of the total data. And after balance, we have that each class has 20% of the data. 
it's important to know that after balance, we got around four times the original data. In this slide, you can see the CNN architecture of our model. We decided to use three convolutional layers, each one followed by a average pooling, and we use three denser layers, each one with a different activation function and a different number of neurons. In the case of the dense layers, uh, the first, we use 256 neurons and the relative activation function. In the second, we use 512 neurons and the sigmoid activation function. And finally, we use five neurons and the Stockman function. In the case of the convolutional layers, we use eight filters and a kernel size equals to 25. For the second, we use 64 filters with a kernel size equal to 6. And finally, we, have, we use 188 filters with a kernel size equal to 2. It's important to note that in order to avoid the overfitting, we decided to use two dropouts between the dense layers. To test and train the model, we decided to use Python version 3.10. We used the 70% of the data for training and the rest for testing. And we select an adapt op optimizer. We use 10 epochs with a batch size equal to 10 and the sparse categorical cross -centrum. The first results that we get were the curve of loss, of loss and accuracy. As you can see in the case of the loss, we can know that it has a continuous decrease. And in the case of the accuracy, it has a continuous increase. It can be a sign, a sign of that the model doesn't have an overfitting or underfitting. Next, we get we got the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix helps us to visualize the correct prediction and the correct prediction. In the main diagonal, we can see all the correct predictions that the model made, and the rest are incorrect predictions. Uh, as you can note, in the case of the N class, uh, it it has the highest number of false negative. And in the case of the S class, that is the supraventricular arrhythmia, it has the highest number of false positive. Um, it's important to note that the most accurate prediction were in the class Q. And um, another Thing that is important to say is that we try to achieve that the model doesn't confuse an arrhythmia as a normal peak. So we try to get zeros in this blue rectangle. Finally, we got we got the matrix with the results of the confusion matrix. We decided to calculate four metrics: precision, recall, specificity, and F1 score for each one of the classes. As you can see, the lowest value in general was for the recall in the normal class. This value is equal to 0 0.97. That means that the 97% of all the normal segments were correctly classified. And you can know that the class Q, all the metrics um, have the highest value. That corresponds to the results of the confusion matrix. Finally, our conclusions are that the results of the metrics were always about the 97%, and compared to another 1DCNN model built by Ahmed et al which took 500 epochs, 
and the results of the metric were above 83%. We used four times the amount of data that they used and 10 epochs. In addition, and finally, we believe that pallet with zero in the segment may limit the accuracy. Because of this, we decided that our future work is train the model with data with all body. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Anna, for your presentation. Do we have any questions here in the room? Yes. Um, my question is, uh, how did you decide which ones you use? Space. <laughs> Can you repeat me the question? How uh, did you use this reducing sigma neurons uh, in stage? Mm -hmm. Do you show me? In the dense layer. Yes. Okay. Um, specifically about the sigma function. Um, where we decided to use different uh, activation function in order to to avoid the overfitting uh, with different function and with these three we got good results. So we do this uh, random function there you get more overfitting. Um, if we use two relu activation functions, it's, it's relevant. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, basically, at the beginning, we started using three relu activation functions in the two layers. So uh, we noticed that at the end, using three same uh, the three relu functions is like using only one. So uh, after that, we started we started to try with another layers with another activation activation functions, and then we noticed that actually we improved our results. So we tried to mm, combine exactly combine and search the best results for us. So that's why we basically use Rolo and Sigma. Those two gave the best results, and at the end, the self max is just like to pull the the not only one result that we want to classify in one of the five classes. That's why we have two different relational functions. Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, my question is about the smooth uh, procedure to increase the, the number of data. Mm -hmm. uh, you use this technique for uh, splitting the data set into training and test set, or before after doing that splitting process? It was used before the training and the testing. Okay, that is a, a methodological flow. We need to split it after splitting the data set, only on the training set. The test set is untouchable. Okay, and the could resource to uh, be overestimated if you use also smooth in the test set. So my recommendation is to use a smooth only the training set and only. And Thank this set is a part. Okay. Okay. Yeah, actually the next steps are actually that. We don't want to touch the 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 signals at all. We want to work with the new ones. Yeah, we're completing the new signals. Yeah, because these results are very high. Is maybe it's because the the smooth in the test set. Okay, and the correct always is to split. And use your training data for all the things that you need to do, training models, everything. And once the model is created, you test it in the test set, only the test set without any any uh, manipulation of this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions online? Online. Hello? Any question?
Thank you, Mr. Kestian. Because why would you classify the bits of your um, your um, series? Why do you uh, use body? Um, I we use body. Yes, for example, can you switch? Um, you put the signal and you can put about I don't know three consecutive uh, beats. Complete uh, curving, for example, the B, uh, QRX complex, and, and T weight. Mm, well, we use an um, open source um, database, so we don't um, we don't make this preprocess. Uh, the data set uh, actually uh, was these characteristics. Um, uh, the authors uh, didn't give you a lot of information because they did that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last presentation is in the bank building an extensive of mammography reviews and projection using the support vector images. The speaker is Fernanda Perez Garza. ¿Quién necesita compartirla? And I'm going to present this paper called Building an Extensive Database for Training Predictive Models in Image Classification of Mammography Views and Projections Using Support Vector Machines. In this presentation, I will talk about introduction, methods, results, and conclusions. Breast cancer is one of the leading causes of death and can manifest as asymmetry as a symmetry between the right and the left breast. For its early detection, mammography or mastography projections are used, which is an X-ray image taken to the breast, commonly in craniocaudal projection and medial oblique projection. In the context of this paper and the asymmetry diagnosis, we implemented morphological features of the breast and support vector machines to classify projections craniocaudal and medilateral oblique with the contralateral views. The database content was uh, metalateral oblique and chronicolor projections with a database size uh, 54,668 mastographies with 48% uh, for chronicolor and 
2% for legislative oblique. In women with an average age of 58 years plus or minus 10 years, labeled with BRAT 0, 1, and 2. This image were in DECOM format. The challenge, we uh, normally save all the image to maintain consistency, consistency, sorry. And to standardizing the resolution, we selected the 521 by 512 pixels. After the normalization, we generate mask for future for feature extractions. First, we applicate a median filter, then a lux binarization with a threshold value of t equals 10 and a standard variation of 0 0.012. As we can see in figure A is the image in the conformant, then in B, Image with a medium filter in B in C. Sorry, uh, we applicate the odds binarization and in D is just the single area. After we have these masks, uh, we classificate the projections. The first feature was to invariant moments because exhibit low variation on the rotation, translation, or scaling. The second feature was the third central moment, which is a symmetry. And as we can see, the lateral oblique projection is more a symmetry than the cranial curve. Another feature was the pixel position, because in the lateral oblique projection, the first pixel or the pixel in the top right corner are commonly white, comparing to the Kramnikova, we don't see white blue. Another feature is circularity and electricity. Thinking the chronicle projection, breasts are commonly observed to have a circular or elliptical shape. For the view classification, we use the centroid of the breast and the centroid the center of the image and if the angle is between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 in a counterclockwise direction it corresponds to the right side and if the angle is between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 in a clockwise direction it corresponds to the left side after these features we create two empty list to store projection and orientation. These features were concatenated into an array and divided into training and testing sets. We use 30% for training and 70% for test. This is a common practice in machine learning because um, we can evaluate the model's performance. And finally, the super vector machine was configured with linear kernel, a regularization parameter C equals one, a tolerance one, 10 times to the mean of three, and none for the class weight. Then we have the average values 
for each characteristic across distinct classes. Then a study was done to find the best turning off type. Giveaway. Uh, every characteristic with the different kernel types. And it shows an accuracy below 70%. But if the features work together, and 99% with a linear kernel, an accuracy with 99%. was evaluated using the confusion matrix, which provides on how well the model was correctly classificated. And we watch the classification of both classes. Finally, the conclusions. This paper aims to classify mastographies based on views and projections for the detection of breast asymmetries using support vector machines with a linear kernel. Geometric features like hue moments, pixel position, circularity, ellipticity, and orientation algo were used for quantification. These features play a crucial role in capturing information about breast asymmetry. This paper innovationally combines established features contributing to enhance accuracy Support vector machines with a linear kernel achieved an accuracy of 99%. This paper contributes to breast cancer detection methodologies with the perspective of creating an organized database for asymmetry, findings with machine learning models, and establishes a framework for future research. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? A question about your method presentation. Uh, you say that you used the implicit term of training. And I do not, I, we, I think that we usually use okay, uh, 70% to training and 30% uh, to test. And I don't know if this is correct. Yes, but what I use this uh, percent and it worked perfectly the super vector machines. No problem. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about the confusion matrix you presented. Right? It, uh, because you obtained these results very high in the, in the previous slide. In this slide, in the next one, uh, there is something strange, isn't it? Because if you zoom the, 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 the row or the column, the zoom uh, should be one because it's the fraction of the, the diagonal are the the heat rate, okay? and the of the diagonal is the error rate. So you have a heat rate, for instance, the 0.5, it means that 50% of accuracy. So I don't know, uh, something strange. I don't know, because if you zoom the column of the, of the row, uh, it should be one, isn't it? Uh, the zoom of our extractions. I don't know if something is strange in this. Yeah, in this yeah, yeah. Total of a true class in the true class and the total of the yeah. class in the post class. Yeah, because normally the confusion matrix is, is counting the errors mm -hmm. and the hits. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And here I think it is the fraction. You divide the, the, the hits by the total. Uh -huh. Is that it? Yes. Okay. But I, I don't know, it's, it's something strange in the, in the computation of this, this confusion matrix. 
later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, about this, 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 this something is strange. I, I know that the results are, are, are good in the previous, but it, it does not correspond exactly with I see in the, in the confusion matrix. Yeah, there, there is something in the, in the, in the calculation. Yeah. It's, it's or maybe it's just the way that they present. Yeah, yeah maybe it's because they didn't conflict. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Amanda. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, what is the size of your original data? Um, I mean, the database is a public database. And you said that you generated a new database. Uh, with all the different options. Um, so now, what is the, the new size of the database? With these 54,000 mammograms, uh, you generate some more because of the options that you have, the different options. So what is the size of the new database? And is it available, that new database that you are generating? The database size uh, was 54,668 mastographies, which is in a public uh, database, which is called RSNA, Screen Mammography Breast Cancer. And when we did the mast, we have the same length. 54,668 mastographies. So it's the same. Mm -hmm. And if I answer your question. So from this database, you have another database that can be used uh, for, for the same purpose that you are using it or for some other. But um, so what, what is the purpose of generating this database? Are you going to and set it available? Yes, it's because the features. So when we download the database, it's in the conformant. So for the features that we extracted, we don't need the, maybe the memorial uh, tissue. tissue. Mm -hmm. So for the features, we just need the shape. So it's the last one uh, that you use for her. Uh, yes, I'm the last one. Yeah. Just the region. And what is it going to be available? You knew, if you already did all that job for us, um, is it going to be available in the new documents? Or not yet? Uh, I think yes, but in another project. Uh, Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That, that's any question? Any question online? It's going to uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. You are the next speaker, right? Can you can you share your screen? Yes. And you see it? We can see it. Yeah, this presentation is a digital classification of transform image in various categories using the analysis composition strategies with convolution of code. 
one of him, Sian Sanchez. Okay, let's start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juan Sainz, and I'm currently a master's student at Simvistap Tamaulipas. On this occasion, I'm here to share with you the research that, together with Dr. Wilfrido Gomez Flores, we have done. Our work is entitled Classification of Res Ultrasound Images in various Categories Using Binary Decomposition Strategies with Convolutional Neural Networks. To put this in context, I'd like to highlight the importance of this research in the fight against breast cancer. Breast cancer is the leading cause of death from malignant tumors in women worldwide. Early detection is essential in the fight against this disease, and imaging studies play a crucial role in this process. In particular, breast ultrasound is used in special cases, such as in women with dense breast tissue or pregnant women, and inconclusive mammograms. Two example, examples of breast ultrasound images are shown in the figure. On the left side, um, we have a venin tumor, and on the right side, a malignant tumor. Okay, the interpretation of these images is performed using the VIRA system, in which radiologists evaluate various findings in seven risk categories of malignancy from which the clinical behavior of patients is determined. Specifically, categories two and three are associated with benign tumors, for which routine imaging studies are recommended. In contrast, categories four and five relate to substitious tumors that require biopsies for evaluation. Because image interpretation depends on human evaluation, computer-aided diagnosis has been developed to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of classifying breast tumors into benign and malignant categories. However, from the virus perspective, considering only two classes of pathology is inaccurate, as the radiologist use seven categories to determine the risk or malignancy. Hence, some current um, CAT systems, sorry, um, hence, some, uh, hence some current CAT system as uh, address the virus classification problem using convolutional neural networks, which automatically learn high level features. However, most of these systems use a single CNN model. That means a single CNN is learned to distinguish among all various categories, which represents a problem since it's prone to have different discriminant power to distinguish each category because the future space learned during, during network training is common to distinguish all categories. In this regard, we have proposed a virus classification method using CNNs with binary decomposition strategies. These strategies map a multi-class problem to several binary problems where each base classifier learns specific features to distinguish between pairs or classes of classes, sorry. Busi Machet used in this work consisted of 1,600 94 image acquired from the National Cancer Institute. The distribution of the image by pathologic class involves benign and malignant cases. And virus categories distribution considers four virus categories enumerated from two to five. The classification problem considered five categor virus categories. Categories two, three, and four in benign tumors and categories four and five in malignant tumors. The proposed approach compared three binary decomposition strategies applied to various ultrasound image classification. First, in the OVA strategy, three binary decomposition, uh, the number of base learners equals the total number of classes C of the multi-class problem, where each binary classifier separates a single class from the rest. Each binary classifier outcomes a score R, Next, the input image is classified by the maximum confidence rule. 
That means that the input image is evaluated on all base learners and classified with the class label distinguishing the base classifier that obtained the highest value response. In this example, the second classifier gets the highest response, so the predicted class is category three. Um, in the over strategy, the number of base learners is equal to C times C minus one divided by two, representing the number of all possible pairs of classes of the multi-class problem. Final classification is carried out by the decision-directed acyclic graph aggregation method. This method constructs a binary tree where a base learner is a node in the graph. Base learner response define the path that the input image follows in the binary tree. In this example, the input image is evaluated in the root node in the top, and which voted for category two. Next, the input image is evaluated of the left shield node, which voted for category four M, and so until reaching the left node, which indicates the final classification. In this example, category three was the predicted class label. And all and one strategy combines the OVA and OVO methods. The 15 base learners are trained. This method works as follows. First, the input image is evaluated in all the base learners of the OVA scheme. Next, uh, the response of the two base learners that produce the two highest values identify in step one. Finally, the input image is classified only with the base learner in the OVO scheme that predicts classes involved in step two. Okay. The CNN exception model was used as the base classifier. Training the exception models for the OVA and OVO strategies was performed employing the stochastic gradient descent learning algorithm with momentum. The very gross cross entropy loss function was chosen to address the challenge of unbalanced classes, specifically uh, in the OVA strategy. Since Exception has more than 20 million training parameters and our data set is small. We apply artificial data augmentation to artificially increase the size of the data set by applying geometric transformation to the original data, such as scaling, uh, rotation, translation, and reflection. Uh, some of the adjusted training parameters were training epochs, learning rate, moment, factor and minibat size. Well, to evaluate and validate our classification models, we implemented a five-fold cross-validation strategy. First, the ultrasound image were converted from grayscale to color images. Then the image set was partitioned into five folds, which ensured that our validation process was comprehensive and representative. For each binary decomposition strategy, a specific training set was created. Next, the training process of the base classifier was carried out. This process includes several crucial steps. Initially, the pre-trained exception model was loaded, adjusting its parameters. This was followed by fine-tuning the model's trainable parameters using the training set. This step is vital to fit the model to a specific classification problem. Then the model was validated at each step with the validation set. And if an improvement in the loss value is observed, uh, the current model is saved. This process ensured that we kept only the most effective models. Finally, for each fault, this training and validation process was repeated until the maximum number of training epochs was reached, making sure to save uh, the model that achieved the best loss value. Next, once all the base models were ready, 
prediction was performed on the test set using the corresponding assembly. After evaluating all the faults and compiling the results, a statistical analysis was performed, which included calculate the mean of the results of the five faults, providing an overall view of the effectiveness of the classification methods. The assessment of classification performance was addressed in two ways. First, multi-class classification performance was evaluated, which involved prediction of, of, of all various categories. Second, pathological class classification performance was evaluated from the various categories. For this evaluation, categories 2, 3, and 4B were merged into the vending class, while the remaining categories formed the malignant K classes class. Finally, in order to compare our results, three reference approach were considered. The first approach denoted as exception five, consisted of a single model learned to predict all virus classes. The second approach denoted, denoted as exception two, was learned to predict pathology classes. It means benign and malignant cases. Finally, the third approach was the radiologist's classification performance on pathologic classes. To evaluate the performance of all models, the performance indices accuracy, Matthews correlation, coefficient, sensitivity, and specificity were used. <clears throat> um, the figure five shows the multi-class confu confusion matrix considering various categories to and phi. Each entry or matrix is the mean of five cross-validation Experiments. Um, it's notable that um, the, the classification errors increased between adjacent classes and diminished as the classes became distant. This behavior uh, is expected since adjacent categories have similar attributes that overlap. And in contrast, very distant categories, such as Virus 2 and Virus 5, have very different futures, so there were no errors be between this class for all the approaches. Table 3 summarized the binary classification performance to predict Benning and malignant pathology classes. Notably, the radiologists um, obtained a perfect sensitivity, indicating that all the truly malignant cases were correctly sent for a biopsy exam. Contrarily, the radiologist got the lowest specificity since many Benning messes were biopsied. The exception two model, training with Benning and Manning class labels, obtaining the highest MCC and ACC and attaining the highest sensitivity among the CNN-based methods. Nevertheless, the over strategy obtaining the highest specificity. Noticeable, all the CNN-based methods increase the specificity compared with the radiologists, but the sensitivity diminished, revealing the trade-off between both indices. indices. By observing the classification performance of multi-class classification methods, the very results was obtained by OVA with an MCC of 0.74 and accuracy of 0.89. Also, it best balanced the sensitivity and specificity with 0.80 and 0.93, respectively. Conclusion and future work. This study compared three binary decomposition strategies for tumor classification in virus categories using CNN models. The experimental results prove that virus classification can perform better with a CNN-based binary decomposition strategies that are using a single CNN model. The OVA strategy obtained the best performance compared to the OVO and Olangwal approaches. CNN-based models improve the specificity regarding radiology's outcomes, which can be interpreted as potential diminishing unnecessary biopsies in benign tumors. Future work considers Finding the best CNN model for each binary classification problem such that the aggregation of response improved the virus classification performance. And that's all. Thank you for your attention.
Turn any place similar to the room. Do you think that it's possible to get an extra error if you use another uh, population with your model? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, do you think it's possible to get an extra error if you use, I don't know, a Mexican, po Mexican population? OK, yes. Uh, it's expected for uh, since the models uh, learn learn it uh, until only the results on images in our data set. Um, probably use another images from other country. Uh, is prone to have different different performance. Thank you. The question online. Thank you very much. Thank you. The presentation is a uh, total power space cancer with many uh, planning. Valley microwave ablation. We add more characterization using uh, battery based uh, aging vectors. The speaker is Daniel Gerardo Serrano Diaz. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Daniel Gerardo Serrano Diaz, and today I'm going to present uh, our paper, uh, which is titled Towards Breast Cancer Treatment Technique by Microwave Ablation via Tumor Characterization using method based agent vectors. Okay. First of all, we are going to talk about and um, briefly about the content of the presentation. We are going to have a um, briefly introduction and methodology, the results, the conclusions, and our references. First of all, we are going to start with uh, some statistics. According to the World Health Organization, the breast cancer is one of the most common cancers worldwide. According to the American Cancer Society, for this year is going to be around 300,000 new cases and nearly 44,000 deaths because of this uh, disease. Um, traditional treatment for breast cancer are surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. And due to the disadvantages and side effects of these treatments, new technologies, meaning that invasive technologies are investigated. One of them is the microwave ablation. This technique uses electromagnetic energy 
radiated by a coaxial antenna to induce heat in the tumors about 60 Celsius degrees for seconds or meters. Okay, here in the image we can see the uh, the ablation zone and the temperatures of a, a red zone. Okay, now to achieve a correct microwave ablation treatment, we need to make a clean a plan. So this planning consists in several steps, according to the several authors. Where the first step is the obtention of the anatomic model. The second is the uh, obtention of the application mod applicator models to generate an application configuration. Then we are going to solve electromagnetic models and thermal models to um, look for uh, an optimized heat in the tumor zone. So this work, this paper, uh, is focused on this step, the anatomic models. We are looking to a form to characterize these models, these tumors, to generate an application, uh, an application configuration. This is the trajectory, the position, the power, the time, and other parameters. So the methodology uh, is shown in this slide, where uh, our first information is the press model. Here we realize we make an analysis of this model to extract from the tumor information. With this information, we process this, this data to uh, obtain a tumor point cloud. Once we have this point cloud, we obtain the centers and the metals, and uh, using both, uh, both results, we can obtain the covariance matrix, and then we could obtain the agent vectors and the agent values. So, first of all, the anatomic models were uh, developed at the Rasmus MC Cancer Institute in Netherlands. This model uh, was obtained for MRI data for breast cancer patients. It's important to mention that every model has its own special step for every coordinate. This is a specific, uh, specific data for the X, for the Y, and for the Z. Here in the table number one, we can uh, see some important characteristics about the tumors in the repository. For example, the tumor volume, the tumor distance between the tumor center and to the skin, and the distance between the tumor tip point to the skin. Okay. Here in this slide, we can see all the models that are in the repository. There are 22 models in total. And every model is segmented and leveled in six different tissues the tumor, the fibroglandular, the fat, the skin, and the bone, and the muscle. Okay, now to, um, to characterize these uh, tumors, we use the principal component analysis, that is PCA. The, to apply the PCA to the tumor characterization, we follow these steps. The first step was to uh, analyze the complete model. Okay, here we use the MAT format because the, uh, all, the, all the models in the repository are saved in two formats, the MAT format and the ROM format. So we use this format to uh, <clears throat> make the analyze easily because we are uh, working on the MATLAB. So, uh, in this format, we only have a unique variable that contains all the voxels of the model. Then, uh, as I mentioned previously, all the models are segmented and leveled. So, the, to process the tumor data, we, you, we only select the corresponding value to the tumor. Then, we pull out every voxel of the tumor to generate our point clouds. And this, uh, this data, was stored in an n by three matrix, where n is the number of the points, and the point cloud was scaled according to the data reports, uh, that give us the repository. Once we have this information, we obtain the centroid that was saved in a vector, and the middle was stated in a vector two. To obtain the centroid, we only make a, a mean of all the Tumor data. 
then to obtain the, the metalloid, we measure the Euclidean, the Euclidean distance between the centroid and every point of the tumor or the point clouds. So we define the metal, the metalloid, where the Euclidean norm was minimum. Okay. Then we, once we have the centroid and the metalloid, we calculate the covariance matrix using this equation. Uh, we calculate this with both that with the with both points with the metalloid and the centroid. And once we have the coverage matrix, we only solve the generalist problem of the agent values to obtain the agent values and the agent vectors. So here in this slide, we can see the first model of the repository. As we mentioned previously, we have different tissues and we can notice different perspective of this model. So here we have the point clouds of the uh, model number one. In this case, the spatial scripts for X was this data, for J was this, and for Zeta was this two. Here we can see the tumor point clouds and the centroid and the metal. In this figure, we make a zoom to notice the difference between the metalloid that is in color green and the centroid that is in color yellow. Okay. Then uh, we obtain the agent vectors and the agent values. This matrix represents the agent vectors values. Every column represents one vector, and this matrix called DC is the agent values matrix where every number corresponds to the magnitude of the corresponding vector. Here, uh, here we also obtain the agent vectors and the agent values, but using the method. The information is in the same order, and we can notice that it's not a big difference between the values in the vectors, even in the, in the magnitude or the, in the value. So, we measure the difference between the angles and the difference between the magnitudes or the agent values. As we can notice, this uh, number, these numbers are very low. So, in a graphical way, we can see the agent vectors, the agent vectors, sorry, in this way. These agent vectors, the biggest magnitude. The agent vector 2 is the color black, is the second biggest uh, agent vector, and the agent vector number 3 is the color red. This uh, data or these agent vectors are uh, according to the method. So the results until this uh, slide were only shown about the model number one, but this methodology was applied to all the repository, so we could obtain this table where we measure the Euclidean distance between the center and the metal, we measure the difference between the agent vectors and the difference between the agent values. And we can notice that the maximum values, for example, in the Euclidean distance was nearly one millimeter, and the difference in the angles was nearly four degrees, approximately. Okay. Okay, so for the conclusion, we are going to resume some of the results. First of all, we uh, mentioned that the maximum clear distance was approximately one millimeter. The maximum difference between the magnitudes was about one millimeter too. But this has an implication. Considering that the safety margin for the ablation, so the, for the ablation treatment, are in the range to, of five to 10 millimeters, the difference that we obtain between the metal and the centroid can be considered inside this margin. So we can use one or another to, um, to be implemented on the training plan. But to verify this assumption, the next step is to model the ablation zone using the centroid and the metal with a specific application. From the PCA of the tumor data, six vectors were created that can be used as proposed position of the microwave applicator. Uh, these vectors are proposed to be a trajectory for the insertion of the applicator, in this case, an antimony. So, 
but more consideration must be done, like the physical restrictions. We know we need to know if these vectors are uh, the direction is to a hair to the hair, sorry, to the skin or to another organ. This restriction must be implemented to pass through the least number of tissues possible and achieve the shorter trajectory between the insertion point that is going to be the skin and the metal. In this case, the information obtained in this paper is the best step to achieve a treatment planning, given that this is based on the tumor morphology. Okay, and that's all. Uh, is there any question? Question: uh, What is the um, another technique or like the, for the performance of the territory? Another method to define the another method. Uh, that uh, could you for this is a for this uh, evaluate the the trajectory of the of the tumor. Trajectory. You mean that the trajectory with the insertion from the skin to the tumor? Sí. Yes. Okay. In some papers, they are um, using only two-dimensional models, okay? They only get the one um, one slide of the tumor on the on the breast, and they calculate the distance, the, the lower distance between the skin and the center of the tumor. Mm -hmm. And they describe that distance like an ideal trajectory. That's its one method. But in our paper, we are working on 3D models, not only in 3D. In this case, uh, to use uh, pedot and, and centroid. Yes. Uh, you combine the both, uh, both points? No, it's not a combination. We use the centroid to um, as a control, okay? Because uh, the centroid sometimes is not a point, a physical point. Sometimes the centroid, it's not physical point or it's not a point where we can see in an image. Okay, so that's why we propose the method because in the, in the application, in the real application, we can see this point or because it is part of what the slices of the imaging um, where when you when the image when the doctor is looking for the insertion. So. Uh, the center was calculated, we use the medoid, and this point is going to be the replace of the center in the real application, only because we can assume that the medoid is a physical and a reachable point in the real world. Okay? It's not a combination, it's like, like a replacement. Okay. Is there any question online? Okay. Uh, speaking about uh, that, uh, the background of the research, some of them they keep themselves in two dimensions. So, yeah, I would like to ask what was the motivation about three Okay, this is because when one, the reason is because of the uh, tumor morphology. Okay, sometimes uh, in several papers, they assume that the tumor has an ideal form, an ellipsoid, a circle, and something like that. So to work with a real form, we use the 3D model, not only the two-dimensional two model. Yeah, that's one of the, that's the main reason. Thank you. What's the 
what's the solution when the path or the way issues is not an an, an achievable way to to insert the antenna. In this case, if there is a there's an a vital organ like heart or or another tissue that is important for the antenna, can it be inserted? <laughs> but what what's the solution? Are you working in that plan B or what's the what's plan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we obtain six vectors okay, that describe the tumor. So we have six different options to choose a, a trajectory. Okay. For example, in this vector is directed to the hair, for example, we can uh, choose this another one because it is perpendicular to it. No, it's not perpendicular. It has uh, it has the opposite direction. Okay. So uh, if this does, doesn't work, we have another option. So that's the purpose. We use three engine vectors to get different options in case we uh, we find that problem that you mentioned, that these vectors are related to the abandoned organ. That is the next work to evaluate which engine vector is the best option, but we, I'm working on it. Okay. Is there any question online? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. Let me share the screen. Oh, I'm in. Can you see my um, screen already? Yes. Yes. Okay. Then I will uh, start. Okay. First of all, I will have to apologize in advance. I'm, I'm going through a throat infection. I'm really swollen and I'm having a hard time talking as well as my energy is not optimal but uh, i'm really thankful for the opportunity for being here and and okay the speaker is uh, Gerardo Gomez Lastra. All right. I guess I, I have to start yes. now. Yes, please. Okay. As I was saying, uh, I, I'm going through a, a throat infection, so my speaking is not optimal, but uh, uh, here we are. Okay, let's get started. Bioimpedance is a technique to quantify the opposition to the flow of electric current through a biological system without generating any alteration or stimulation in the tissue. Basically, it consists of injecting a normally sinusoidal current uh, signal with known amplitude and frequency to the tissue and measuring its resulting voltage. From these two signals and using Ohm's law, um, the bioimpedance is calculated. The applied signal can be of a single frequency, 
uh, could be multi frequency um, where uh, different uh, frequencies uh, are applied, or it could be electrical impedance spectroscopy, uh, where a spectrum of signals are injected, resulting in a spectrum of bi impedance measurements. This last mode, the electrical impedance spectroscopy, is commonly used to characterize biological systems in, as in other spectroscopic uh, techniques. On the other hand, uh, the discrimination of data by machine learning deals with a computational method that makes use of experience to make uh, predictions. I'm sorry. That is uh, an algorithm that receives input data uh, the, or the training data sets to learn and find a pattern that will uh, that it will use to predict the output of new data. When implementing machine learning, the goal is to find uh, a configuration or set of hyperparameters that generates a generalized model uh, with a satisfactory prediction performance when inputted when inputting never before seen data. There are different types of machine learning algorithms. For the purposes of this work, we will focus on the supervised and unsupervised learning. The supervised uh, learning is uh, the one that develops a function that relates an input to an output based on a set of pairs input-output examples. And that is uh, a labeled uh, data set. The developer has to have a data set whose uh, label or output is already known. On the other hand, unsupervised uh, learning algorithms are called in such a way because unlike supervised learning, in this type of machine learning, there is no defined feature extraction and therefore the algorithms have freedom to learn without human bias. Uh, these algorithms learn from the data itself and when new data is entered, they use what they have learned from the previous data to recognize the type of uh, data entered. We have already investigated the comparative aspects of extremities in the same subject. Bioimpedance uh, is commonly used as a diagnostic tool based on differences on bioimpedance spectra from tissues. Uh, but we have found that such differences could be due to simply because of non-pathological conditions, impaired organs, uh, such as differences in muscle uh, development, uh, as, in a, as in the arms of a tennis player where the right hand or the, the the dominant hand is uh, way more developed uh, than the other hand. Um, so methods for the classification of non-pathological conditions from bioimpedance data are of, are of interest. In a previous work, we have evaluated the performance of four machine learning classifiers to assess the differences between dominant and non-dominant upper limbs from bioimpedance measurements. In this work, uh, we evaluate the impact of the pre-processing of the bioimpedance spectra, as well as in the inclusion of the phase spectra to the analysis on the performance of machine learning algorithms for the classification of upper limbs. We performed the measurements uh, on 19 subjects, um, 11 females and 8 males, all, all Caucasian. Um, the average age was nine, 29 years old. The average weight was 64.45 uh, kilograms. Average height was uh, 168 centimeters. And the average body mass index was 22.8 kilograms per square meter. I'm sorry. Um, the measurements were made using a device based on the AD15933 evaluation board from analog devices. I'm sorry. in a bipolar configuration. That means we use only two electrodes, two uh, disposable electrocardiogram electrodes placed on the ends of the biceps. All measurements were performed in triplicate, in triplicate obtaining a total of 114 spectra. The frequency, um, I'm sorry, two spectra were eliminated due to excessive noise, uh, one from left arm and one from right arm resulting in 66 and 56, I'm sorry, the spectra from the right arm, which is the dominant arm in all of the subject, and 56 uh, spectra from left arm. The frequency range in which the measurements were made was from one to 300 kilohertz. 
in one in one kilohertz steps. However, for this work, the signal were processed and delimited between two and one hundred kilohertz because of evident noise in frequencies below below two kilohertz and above one hundred kilohertz. Uh, in this work, four classification models were evaluated, random forest, linear discriminant analysis, night bias, and k-means. These um, classification models were arbitrarily selected, uh, as in the previous work, in, in the way that we could uh, um, compare our results in this work from, with, the previous, with the previous work. Uh, by impedance measurements for each ex excitation signal frequency were entered as features. That, that is, 99 measurements were entered as features or characteristics uh, for each subject with their corresponding label, right arm or left arm, or dominant and non-dominant arm. Uh, as, as figures of merit uh, for the evaluation of uh, performance of the classifiers, we use sensitivity, specificity, and precision. Um, in the work that precedes the present one, uh, the complete spectrum of magnitude was used to train the different classifiers, including, inclu including the frequency ranges in which noise was identified. In this work, we used the limited range with the magnitude and phase spectra in order to assess whether both and pins parameters allow us to distinguish between the right and left arm, or dominant or non-dominant. Um, and the classification models with the magnitude and phase spectra were evaluated independently. Uh, data sets were randomized, and 80% of the randomized data was used as the training set, using 20% of the data for the test set. The models were trained and evaluated by performing a thousand repetitions, uh, including the randomization of data. Um, Obtain in obtaining their performance metrics in each one of the repetitions. The mean and standard deviation of each performance metric was calculated. In addition, we look for the maximum value of each performance uh, metrics. So we can could com compare it with the previous work. From the magnitude spectra, the random forest classification model presented the best uh, performance metrics above the other models evaluated, obtaining 76% of sensitivity, 91% of specificity, and 83% of precision. The model with the worst performance was, was uh, night bias, um, obtaining only 47% of sensitivity, 43% of specificity, and 45% of uh, precision. The K, the K mean means model, I'm sorry, obtained 49% uh, in sensitivity and specificity and 49% of precision. The LED model, LED, LDA model, um, obtained the second best performance. From the phase spectra, the random forest classifier also obtained the best performance with 62% of sensitivity, 87% of uh, specificity, and 74% of uh, precision. From the analysis of the maximum performance values of each model using the magnitude spectra, we observed that the random forest classifier model obtained 100% in sensitivity, specificity, and precision, which is the ideal performance as the maximum value uh, um, of, the, of the performance, I'm sorry. The K-means model obtained 100% as the maximum value of uh, sensitivity and specificity and 82% of uh, precision, uh, as well as uh, the LDA model, which uh, obtained 100% in sensitivity, 100% in specificity and 82% of uh, precision. The LDA model obtained 100% of, uh, I'm sorry, the NAI bias model obtained 100% of sensitivity as, um, as the maximum value of, of, of the performance metrics, and 91% of specificity and 82% of accuracy, precision, sorry. From this table, we can uh, assess the impact of data randomization, the number of iterations, and the data processing performed in this work on the performance of the classification models compared to the work reported in the previous work, 
where pre-processing was not performed and only uh, 10 interventions were were made this is this these are the the maximum values from the previous work and we can um, observe that and uh, the this and the pre-processing and, and etc uh, has a, a great impact in in the results and the performance of the classifiers from the magnitude spectral result we can observe that the random forest classifier was the uh, the achieve the best performance. This observation coincides with our previous work. We believe that this could be the, the case because of the nature of the data and its statistical differences documented in the previous work. Although we thought uh, the naive bias classifier would be the best in performances because of its statistical origin, it achieved the worst figures of merit. Of, of merit. We believe that the reason uh, is that the naive bias classifiers assumes independence of features from each other and gives them the same weight of importance. Since the statistical differences of the bioimpedance measurements are present in the first frequency value of the model spectrum up to 45 uh, kilohertz, the naive bias classifier could be the spice in the statistical differences because it's not present in the whole spectrum. To the author's understanding, this is uh, this and the previous work are the first studies assessing the differentiation of upper limbs using bioimpedance measurements or any other technique for all this work. Uh, the application of these findings could be implemented in wearable devices that are sensitive to the arm of the patient where it's being used. As an idea, uh, these findings could be useful integrated in a smart cane for the blind and visually impaired patients where the navigation system is crucial as it could have more information about the relative position of objects to the patient. Also, of our findings could be assessed for other body parts, so there are a lot of applications where wearable and smart devices could serve from the information of where in the body uh, the device is being used. Machine learning is an extremely useful tool in many industries. The health area is, not, is no exception, so its introduction into different areas of medical knowledge is not only inevitable, but also of utmost importance. Uh, in this work, as an exploratory scope, the performance of four classification models was evaluated when the data entered our bioimpedance spectra, taking into account each of the measurements at each frequency of the spectrum as features or characteristics. This is of interest for the application of recognition of parts of the body, an area not very explored. In this case, the differentiation between the dominant and non-dominant arm is a first step that, allow, that allows differentiating uh, the measurements that carry a bias in themselves, as shown in previous work, that if not considered, has a significant influence on the conclusions of the bioimpedance measurements and could really lead to uh, could mislead the, the, the um, diagnosis. Um, Bioimpedance measurements present a low cost, safe and non-invasive clinical test. As they are one dimensional electrical signal, signals, the application of post acquisition processing is a simple task with low computational cost. This work shows us a, a machine learning process that provides encouraging metrics for the implementation of, in, of an integrated measurement and acquisition device of the tiny L or tiny machine learning type that adapts to the biomedical needs of healthcare and, and professionals. <coughs> I'm sorry. And that'll be all for me. I uh, thank you for your attention. Question. Uh, in your best application, it's important to mention the, for example, the amplitude of the current that you are injecting uh, to the to the body. I don't know if you mentioned. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, hear the last part. Can you? Ah, okay. I stopped listening, uh, uh, but the importance of the amplitude of the Yes, uh, well, in, in the application, it's important to mention the, 
the current of the, the, the amplitude of the current that are injected. And other question is which features of this of the of the impedance, the impedance signals you are uh, obtaining for the for your uh, model uh, or classification. The, well, the the rough signal or what which type of characteristic are you are obtaining from that signals that you are obtaining? We use the, the magnitude spectra and the phase spectra as in, in, in magnitude uh, versus frequency and phase and phase angle versus frequency. We didn't uh, process any of, of that. That, that. That is interesting to do and, and to evaluate whether uh, a different presentation of bioimpedance information uh, could be better uh, or could be or, or could has an, uh, be a better impact in the performance of classifiers of the models. Um, I don't know. Maybe the cold model will be useful, or for or or we could maybe use the the machine learning algorithms to extract these uh, parameters that are important and, and that are related to some different uh, health conditions as 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 some uh, cold parameters. Uh, but in this work, we just uh, evaluated the magnitude and the phase spectra. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, you, you did a comparison. You compared your results versus previous works results, and you have best uh, best metrics than previous works. But why do why why do you think you obtained uh, better, the best metrics or better metrics than in previous works? Well, as what I... Did you, what, did you do, what did you do of different well, than that's, in previous works? That's an interesting question. Let me go back to the presentation so I can... Oh, no, I just said that. Oh, okay, let me... Okay, we, in this work, uh, the different uh, method that we use is that we pre-processed the the, the bioimpedance spectrum as that we eliminate the frequency ranges where there was a lot of noise. That noise was um, inputted in the la in the previous work, but in this work, it it wasn't. That is the first uh, big difference. The other is that in this work we used we made. 1000 iterations while in the previous work we will just did 10 iterations and also in this work we uh, included the phase spectra in the analysis while in the previous work we did not we just used the the model the, the by impedance magnitude spectra those differences show that um, um, according to our results show that uh, the performance of the classifiers were better so um, that it's a uh, Mm. Our findings uh, are that uh, it is good for to pre-process the data, uh, eliminate the noise, of course, and also include the phase spectra in the in the analysis. Thank you. Mm. So, any question online? Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Gracias.